children, I call your attention to Acts chapter 2, and particularly from verse 29 to verse 47. Here in this section, there is actually a window into what it was like to be a member in the early church of our Lord Jesus Christ. Very often, brothers and sisters, because we have come to church so often, and for so many years now for some of you, that you have forgotten what it is to be a church, what it is to be a part of a church. Now we are grateful that in recent months, we have the privilege to renovate this, our meeting place. We have made it more conducive for our utility and for our purpose of for this uh, premises and thank God that uh, in His providence, JTC also has uh, upgraded our toilets for us. Some, some of you have not seen the toilet yet, so later on you take a look at it. It is very nicely and uh, tastefully renovated for our purpose and uh, for all these things we are grateful. But let us not forget the reason why we are here in these premises. We are not here to look at all the beautiful surrounding and what we have done with the, the premises, the, the place. Brother, brothers and sisters, I hope you remember that we are here to do the work of a church. But what is church? What is a church? And that is very important and I'd like to call back your attention to this subject that we have considered before. But nonetheless, we need to frequently think about so that we will not imagine the church to be a concert hall, a place where you go and listen to a beautiful choir presentation, or go to a church and then you think that you're going to a cinema to look at a drama or play or skit or whatever, whatever and all these things. No, brothers and sisters, let us look at what the Bible tells us a church is. You realize that some people will think of a church as a building, and that is how the English language is being used in our modern time. When you ask somebody, where is your church? The person is not asking you, what is a church? The person is asking you, where is the building? A church building, for example, like St. Andrew's Cathedral downtown of Singapore. Other people, when they hear the word church, the English word church, they think in their mind of a place. A place, for example, a place for wedding, a place for a funeral, and brothers and sisters, that's what they had in their mind when they think of a church, either a building or a place. But that's not how the English word should be used according to the Word of God, according to the Holy Bible. Because when the Holy Bible uses the word church, it is not talking about a building, it is also not talking about a place for whatever purposes that may be. The word church actually is used to describe a gathered people or an assembly. The syn synonym is an assembly, a people gathered. They have been gathered for the purpose of worship and for the fulfillment of the gospel mission given by the Lord Jesus Christ. And so let's bear this in mind that the church is not a place, the church is not a building and with this in our understanding, in our mind, let us look at two pictures that the Lord Jesus Christ employed to describe what His church is. The first picture is that of an assembly. The word that is used in the Greek New Testament is the Greek word ecclesia. Ecclesia. You hear the word ek in the front. Ecclesia. Ek. The word that ek is actually out of. Ecclesia is the Greek word for calling. So call out of. In other words, brothers and sisters, the church is an assembly that is called out of or assembled from different places. Wherever you were, some of you in the marketplace, some of you in the shopping center, some of you in the coffee shop eating, and then the Lord called. He Hall and all of you, wherever you are, you're called out of your breakfast, out of your shopping, out, and then you all quickly come and you are gathered here. So when people look at you, they say, Ah, Ecclesia, meaning to say, This is a people that Jesus Christ has assembled everywhere else. That's the word Ecclesia. Now, in the Greek, it is called Ecclesia, but in English, we cannot translate Ecclesia. Nobody will know what is Ecclesia. So the English-speaking people use the word church. 
But because it is a group of people that is called out from different places to, to assemble here, and then you give the word church, after a while, instead of the people, the assembly, people started to associate the word church with the place. Or when it, a building is being constructed, they started to refer to the building as church. They have forgotten that it's not building, it's not place, it's the assembly of people. That's the problem with the English language and that's the problem with us, the modern people. It is the same every morning. You hear the school bell, clang, 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 and children started to run from the gates, from their classroom, from ever. They were playing in the field, in their hall, or in the toilet, everywhere. The clang, 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 they all start to run. Where do they run to? The assembly hall. And why do they run to the assembly hall? Because it's assembly. It's going to sing the national anthem, they take the national of a, a, a pledge and so they all assembly. So what do you call that? You call that the school assembly. But when the principal or whoever it is go to the microphone and then to, uh, to, to address the school assembly, they will say, school, attention, isn't it? So this becomes school. Eh, I thought school means a building. Eh, I thought school means a place. You see, it's the same problem here. That people started to use the word school but the word school start to become a building rather than the children, the teacher. And so it is with the word church. The church is referring to people. That's how the Lord Jesus Christ uses this word. If you turn to Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, look at how the Lord Jesus Christ said about his church. He said, on this rock I will build my church. On this rock, I will build my church. Now, in, on the context of it, nobody would say that the word that church is a building, but he's talking about his people. Further on, two chapters later in Matthew 18, and there you hear, you will hear that hear a more clearer picture of what the church is. It's about people in verse 17, for example, it says, Tell the church. And then even to the church two times, you hear the word that church being used by our Lord Jesus Christ. Both times, all these three times in the Gospel of Matthew, they all refer to assembly of people or the Christian assembly as you may want to refer to it. And so the church refers to a people rather than a place or a building as it is commonly used in the English language today. The Lord Jesus Christ, when He addressed the church, He is referring to a people who were separated from other people. This is my church. He said that this is a group of people I call and they have come and assemble here in front of me and they are separated from others that I am not called. And so to be part of a church is a wonderful privilege. It means that we have been separated from the world, separated from other unbelieving people, separated from the wicked and we are assembled in the presence of God. If we understand the word church in this way, brothers and sisters, it is really going to transform how we view a church. Church then is no longer a place. Church then is not where we go on Sunday morning. Church is we, ourselves, you. You are church wherever you are spiritually. You are assembled with Jesus Christ wherever you are in spirit and in truth. You are His people. You have been separated. You were at a coffee shop eating your breakfast. You were doing your marketing. You were working hard. But when <coughs> Jesus said, Come! You came. Come where? Come here! And so you all came here. And the Lord Jesus said, You are my church. How wonderful it is, brothers and sisters. That is why every Sunday morning, you realize that when we are ready to worship God before the worship service, you hear the pastor or the preacher or whoever it is here, Elder Salem too. You hear a call to worship. Come. This morning I read for you the call to worship and where they are reading from. If you would like to look there with me, brothers and sisters, it is from Psalm 95. And Psalm 95, what is the word there in Psalm 95? It says, Come. Come. Let us shout joyfully to the Lord. Come. What do you mean by come, Pastor? It means be gathered together. Come.
be gathered as a church now. We are going to worship God and do His will. Come, wherever you are. You can be sitting here, I know, but where are you mentally? Hey, hello, where are you? You are still bothered by what happened. You just quarrel with some people on the phone or wherever you are on your way here. You were angry, whatever. You were distracted by what happened at work and all these things. But when I say, come, I'm saying, let all this be put aside. Come. Be separated from all this thing. Come and be assembled here in the presence of God because we are going to worship God. And so I hope you had all these things in mind and there's such a lovely thought about what the English word church represents will really warm your hearts and cause you to realize, wow, so important that I'm sitting here together with others because physically we are representing a picture of what Ecclesia means what the word church really means is not a people, it's a people, it's not a place or a building. The people call out from other people in order to be a, a, assembled in the presence of God. Now, this is how Peter understood that the, that, 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 that the church is a group of people God called out from elsewhere. You look there in 1 Peter chapter 2. And see how wonderfully Peter describes the situation in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. Peter says, Who call you out of darkness into his marvelous light. This is the sense that people, Peter is trying to convey to you. Hello? Are you a church? Are you part of the church? Do you know that the church is actually a people that God, God called out of darkness? The world is in darkness. God called them out of the world, out of darkness, into His presence. He says, assemble here in my presence. Assemble here. Come, come here. And in, in the presence of God, there is light. You see, if you go, refuse to respond, you want to continue in darkness, you will die in your sin. But God said, come out, come out, come here, come here, come here. You are my people, you, you come here, and uh, you too come here, you, you come here, and then you say, yes, I come, I come, I obey God, and you come, and you have light, and you are in the presence of God, and God's promise to you is, because you listen to me, you obey me, you come, I will protect you, I will be your king, I will love you, no matter how difficult your life is, what challenges you may be, you will always be beside me. Because I will always love you. And I hope, brothers and sisters, that is how you understand this morning. Now, the, this picture of the church is the, exactly the picture you find in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, the passage that I read for you. When you read there, brothers and sisters, from verse 44 to the end of the chapter, that is the picture of a people. They come from different families. They come from different places where they make their homes and then when God called they all came and formed an assembly together they came together look at what we are told there in verse 44 in chapter 2 of Acts now all the believers were together gathered together the word there together is assembly you see were an assembly and then they held all things in common they sold their properties their possessions and distributed the proceeds what they make from the selling to all as any had need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together. They were together. Why together? Because they are a church. God has called them out from wherever they were. Come! Come here! And they obeyed. They came here. And how wonderful they were. They were loved by God. But more importantly, I hope to impress this upon you, brothers and sisters, which is seriously lacking in our congregation all these years, is this. If you look carefully at this passage of the early church, you realize here very immediately a strong sense of togetherness. A strong sense of togetherness. A, song, a strong sense of belonging to one another. And I hope to impress upon you, brothers and sisters, that this is what it means. Because you know who called you, God called you. And where did He call you? He called you to come here. And because you are called together, suddenly you realize that you are together and you are of the same group. 
you are going to help one another, support one another, and do all you can to love one another. That is exactly what God has called you to do. The question then for you brothers and sisters and children is, is this picture of the church, is this picture of the church projected by you every time you gather together? Are you a group of people called out from the world by God Himself and you are gathered together to worship God and to serve Him and to fulfill the Great Commission? Are you such a people? Do you belong to this group? You see, sometimes you may not belong to this group because you don't even know that that's what the church is. Now you know. A church is a people God has called to come here and you have obeyed. You did not remain in your sin. You did not remain in your, 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 your bad habits. You decided to leave everything and you come here. And because you come here, God loves you. And God will take care of you. You realize that that is what the church is? The church is a people, a group of people who have decided that they don't want to continue in their sin. They want to obey. They want Jesus to be their king. They will obey their king. And that's you, brothers and sisters. That's you, children, and so let us be encouraged. The second picture used by our Lord Jesus Christ to describe the church, the Lord Jesus Christ used the picture of the human body, the human body, okay, the picture of the human body. For that, I just want to, for example, draw your attention to Romans chapter 12, and there you find a mention of this. The Romans chapter 12, verse 4 to verse 5. Romans 12, look at the picture that is used to describe the church. Now, as we have many parts in one body, and all the parts do not have the same function, in the same way, we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Look at your body. Your body is made out of many parts. You have hands, you have ears, you have nose, you have mouth, you have eyes. You have a brain, you have a kidney, you have a liver, you have legs, you have poles, you have fingers, you have tongue. There's so many parts. Right? You have your tongue inside your mouth, you have teeth. There are so many parts making up a body. So a human body is not one piece. A human body is actually made out of many pieces joined together. And then you become a human body. That is what the Holy Bible is saying when it says, uh, the, the parts do not have the same function. Do you speak with your hand? Yeah, some people say, yeah, no, Pastor, I use sign language. Okay, very good. Do you do you uh, whistle with your eyes? No, you cannot whistle with your eyes. Do, do, do you speak your saliva with your ears? No, you don't do that because different parts are given specific responsibilities. Now turn to Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. And verse 11 to verse 12, you find a mention of the body of Christ again. I'm just giving you two examples in order to convince you that this is the second picture that is used of the church. Ephesians 4 verse 11 says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ. The body of Christ is another picture you refer to the church. So you have an assembly, come here! And then this group of people you make up the Christian church, the church. Another way to describe them is the human body. Look at your human body. What is the part of the human body that God has chosen to be the head of the body? Where? The head Ah, it is the head. The head is where the brain is and it is where you decide where to go. The leg will listen to the decision that is made in the head. So that's the head. The head is very important to the whole body because the head is the central controlling system, right? That is how it is. The church also has a head because Christ is the head of the body. Look at Ephesians again to chapter 5 and verse 23. Who is the head of the body? Ephesians 5 verse 23 says, Because the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the church, he is the saviour of the body. So, 
you have heard the call. Come, come out of sin. Come out of your your bad habit. Come out of your sin and repent. Come here. And you have heard his voice. You have come here, and then you are assembled before him, and he loved you because you are you have listened to him. And there, here you are now. Tell me, who is the monitor? Who is the prefect? Who is the head of this group of people? Not the pastors, you know. Who? Jesus Christ. You have come out. You are no longer your own king. You are no longer the master of your own destiny. You have come here. And then you come here. And then who do you listen to? Who do you follow? The Lord Jesus Christ. Why do you follow Him? Because He is the head. He is the King of kings. The Lord of lords. You love Him. That's the reason why you are a Christian. Look at Colossians, to Colossians, to Colossians chapter 1, and see here how the Lord Jesus Christ is being described. Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18, it says that He is also the head of the body, the church. So I hope that by now, you would have been convinced that God has a group of people in this world. It's not a place, it's not a building. It is an assembly of people who have heard the call to come here and you have responded. So here you have the church. This is a group of people, they love the Lord. And the Lord say, I'm the head of this church because I call you, you responded to me, I am your leader. And you say, yes, yes, he is our Lord and our King. And you have him here, he is the head of you. Now, how did you do that? How did you end up here as a church? Well, the Bible tells us that there is only one way to join the church. There is only one way to become a part of the body of Jesus Christ. And that is the Holy Spirit giving you the new birth or to be born again spiritually. Can you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12? And that is what is taught there. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 to 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verses 12 to 13 for just as the body is one and has many parts and all the parts of that body though many are one body so also is christ for we were all baptized by one spirit into one body where the jews or greeks where the slaves of free and we were all given one spirit to drink so here is very clear it's talking about being baptized by the holy spirit in other words, a picture of regeneration, a picture of being born again. And when you do, you are now a part of the body of Jesus Christ, the church. Just as the human body, the human head controls the human body, control what it does, where it goes, what to eat and what not to eat, so also Christ must be the head of his body, the church. And this is serious, brothers and sisters. This is serious. You cannot say that you are part of the body, but you are doing your own thing and you are living your own life. You cannot. You know what that means, right? That means you are a cancer. Sooner or later, you will have to be amputated. You will have to be cut off because you are causing the other parts of the body to be sick. That's what cancer is. Cancer is something that is not obeying the other body. It's not caring for the other body. Cancer is something that is caring for only itself. It continues to spread and continue to suck out the resources in the body and causing the other parts of the body to get sick. You will be cut off because you are not really part of the body in that sense. And so it is, brothers and sisters. The Holy Bible describes you as the, the, the various parts of a human body. So you have eyes, ears, mouth, nose, arms. You have legs and hands and fingers and thumbs and toes and all these things. Look there in 1 Corinthians again, chapter 12, verses 14 to 18. I'm trying to just read this long passage and break it into different smaller parts so that it's easier for us to follow. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 14 to 18. Indeed, the body is not one part but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body. It is not for that reason any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body. 
it is not for that reason any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God has arranged each one of the parts in the body just as He wanted. It is a fact. I have increasingly come to understand this. this is a reality. Brothers and sisters, God has different callings for His people in the church. There are some people who want to be pastors, who want to preach, but they do not have the gift of public speaking. Or they have a long tongue, they call it the Hawking say the long tongue. And they speak with a with a, an impediment. It's very hard for people to hear. And God has not called you like what Charles Spurgeon says. Charles Spurgeon says that if God has called you to be an athlete, he would have given you a pair of good legs and a pair of good lungs. You don't need only just legs, you know, lungs also must be good to be a good runner. And therefore we must be very uh, humble. And uh, very, uh, very true to God in, in our realization. God has not called everybody to be a teacher. And God has not called everybody to be an elder or a deacon. We are good in different things. If God has not called you to be something, it doesn't mean you are no good. That is what is wrong with the feminists. The feminists has, has this wrong idea. That if I'm not a man, if I cannot do whatever a man can do, therefore I'm an inferior kind of creature. You know, you are making me, you are discriminating against me. This nonsense, brothers and sisters, this nonsense. This, this is not wrong, wrong, this is the wrong way of thinking. Because God has not made the man to be pregnant for nine months. You know that nine months is a long period of time. It's great pain and discomfort and a great toil on the human body for a poor woman to carry a child for nine months and then to give birth. Oh, if you have not seen a woman giving birth, you should in your life if you have the child. It's so painful. You have to have epidural and all or else cesarean to, 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 to cut the, 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 the duration of pain. Brothers and sisters, it's not easy to be a woman. And why should you want to be a man? When you show such courage, you show such endurance, you show such a high calling of God to be a mother of a woman, why do you want to be a man? It's silly. And therefore we must be humble and be the person God has intended you to be by nature rather than want to disrupt God's intention and sin against Him. We Christians are called by God to care for one another just like their eyes and the ears and every part of the human body must be synchronized, must cooperate in order to keep the human body healthy. To keep the church healthy, we must help one another too. To grow the church, everybody must play the part. If you got some people don't want to do this, don't want to do that, and angry, compare and say, hey, why you do, uh, why, why what must I do and you don't do? And Brothers, sisters, we have an assembly who have heard the call of God, but they are not cooperating together. It's a disgrace. Who do you disgrace? You disgrace the useless head of the family. And who is that? Jesus Christ. You cause the name of Jesus Christ to be disgraced. People will look and laugh and people will look and say, lousy leader, not a pastor, you know. Because a pastor is only a servant. It is the glory of the head of the church that is being called into question. And so let us care for one another just as we look at one another. Now, this is important, this verse. So I am calling you now, please turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Look at what you are told there, verse 26 to verse 27. This is important, two verses here. 1 Corinthians 12, 26 to 27. So, if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honoured, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individual, individual members of it. This ought to be very dear to us. It's not about you. It's not about your children. It's not about my wife, my husband. It's not about you as an individual. It's about together. When you see the Lord prospering a church, let's be happy for them. 
If PCC is growing, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. If PCC is not growing, but in trouble, we feel the pain. We are so sad. And we cry and we pray for them. As if PCC is our own personal church. That should be our intention because we belong to Christ. We must help one another. So I come to ask you again, do you belong to the body of Christ? Do you see yourself as one of the parts of the body? Do you see yourself as being able in the coming years to contribute to one aspect that you feel that God has given you a gift? I know some of you, you are good in music, piano, guitar and all. I do really hope that in the coming future when you grow up, you will think, I want to working hard, I'm training and practicing hard because one day, one day, I want to serve the Lord in playing and contributing in that aspect. And I hope that you do, brothers and sisters, that you will be able to be human. Body. So, we have just said that the Lord Jesus Christ uses two pictures to describe His church. That the picture of a, uh, an assembly and the picture of a human body. The church is not a place, it's not a building. The, the church is actually a group of people that he has called from different places and families and nations and languages. He said, come here! And they have listened to him and they all came together and the Lord said, I, I, you are now my people, I am your, your leader, listen to me and I'll take care of you and protect you. And we do. And we realize that the, the assembly of people, there are so many different kinds. Got black people, got white people, yellow people, and all sorts of people. And the Lord says that you have different gifts. Some of you are good in this, others of you are good in that. Oh, you all have different gifts. Come, let's use our gifts together. Those of you who can do this, do this, those of you. You know, in the construction of the tabernacle of God and the, and the temple of God, do you realize that God uses people according to their gifts? The stonemason, all of them gang together to be involved in anything to do with stone. Those people who are good in sewing gang together and participate in anything to do with sewing. And the others, artists and all these things, they were all given their gifts according to their abilities. God will never call you to do something that you do not have the ability to do. So let us be realized. Do not be discouraged and say, well, I'm so sad, I cannot do the, that, that grand thing. God has not called you. Why should you be sad? Find out what you have that you can contribute, brothers and sisters. I tell you honestly, I am not asking for fundraising or whatever. I'm just stating a fact out here. I know of somebody who is very good and generous. Anytime the church needs money, you tell the person, the person come up with the fund to, to support. At some time, his own and her own great uh, sacrifice. And so you realize, ah, you have the gift of being generous. The people without people like that, uh, the church without people like that cannot function. And so it is. Other people, whenever they travel, they must bring things back to the church. You realize that, no? They buy things back for the church. They not just buy things back for their own family members. They always will think, ah, then on Sunday, ah, hey, on Sunday, when we go back, on Sunday, what, what should we bring to the church, you see? It's a good sign, you know? Don't be discouraged. Don't say, yeah, why am I so wasteful? No! You should be encouraged. And I hope nobody is discouraging people. You know, I have heard with my ears some years back here in our own congregation when people got something, they say, Yeah, why you bring buy this? You waste money. Why are you so expensive? You buy for what? Hello? The person wastes a lot of money but did not buy for you. Like. The person bought all these things for other people. If you don't want to eat, please don't eat. Don't discourage people and accuse people for wasting money and all these things. Because a person feel happy. I can go on a holiday. There are so many people in the church never been to this holiday. And I am bringing something back to share with them. What's wrong with that? Who are you to be the judge to say waste money, la, spend so much money? It's none of your business. Because the person is doing it because the person is part of a group. And the person is given the gift of generosity. We should be happy. We should say praise the Lord next time by more. Isn't it? And we all enjoy 
That should be our attitude, brothers and sisters. I have spoken all these things because I'm actually drawing you to the third point, the last point of this message, which is this. How do you recognize the, the true body of Jesus Christ, the true assembly? There are so many people who claim to be the church. There are so many people who claim to be the body of Jesus Christ. How do you identify the true church and the true body? Well, do you know, brothers and sisters, not every church, not every church is really a body of Christ. Not every church. I say this because the Holy Bible itself says not every church is a true church of Jesus Christ. There are such a thing called the synagogues of Satan. The synagogues of Satan. For example, in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 9, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 9, the false church is referred to as the synagogues of Satan. The false synagogue. They are the synagogues of Satan. And therefore, it is important then for us to realize this, that today we learn that the church is an assembly of people, the church is a body of Christ. How do we recognize the assembly? There are so many people assembled there. That one is actually primary school, school assembly, that one? Secondary school assembly. How do you recognize which one is primary school, which one is secondary? Well, firstly, the school uniform. Secondly, the age group, right? Oh, the older people should be the secondary school. This is a primary school. But how do you identify the true body of Christ, the true assembly that belongs to Jesus Christ? Everybody claim they obey God. Everybody say, oh, I heard the, I heard the call of God and therefore I come. But how do we know which is the right group? Well, the Bible gives you, brothers and sisters, three marks. You find three marks of a true assembly. Look there, brothers and sisters, back to the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. And look at what you are very, very, very clearly taught from the start. That the first mark of a true church is that of the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look there in chapter 2 of Acts and verse 41. He says, so those who accepted his message were baptized. Please take note, he says, so those who accepted his message, the word their message is preach message, sermon, preaching, were baptized. He didn't say, and those who were touched by that drama presentation. Or those people, they were those people who were touched by the beautiful singing of that song. No, 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 no. It's a sermon. It's preaching, brothers and sisters. It's not entertainment, but it's preaching that is actually the mark of a true church of Jesus Christ. You remember in the Great Commission, we always talk about baptizing. We all go into all the world, go into all the world, go to, but go into all the world is the beginning. But what is the heart of that mission? The heart of the mission is to teach them to observe everything that I have commanded you. Matthew 28 and verse 3. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And how do you do that? Preaching. Preaching, brothers and sisters. It is through preaching that the mission of Jesus Christ, the gospel mission, is fulfilled. That is why. We find that in a Reformed church, and this is how you, learn, you, you must insist on it to find a Reformed church, all the Reformed churches that I have been, when it comes to preaching, the pulpit is always in the center of the hall. Why can't we be on the side? Eh? There's a pulpit there also. Then here at least we can put a beautiful painting or do something beautiful. You put the organ in the center. Lah. Why can't? No, no, no. It's symbolic. It's symbolic. Why do you do that? Because we want to show that preaching is the most important focal point in the church. If you are a true church, the first mark of a true church is the centrality of the preaching. <coughs> and it is very interesting, brothers and sisters, in my traveling, I've come to realize this. The, I like, as a pastor, as a Christian first, when I go to a different country or different cities, I like to visit every now and then. If I have a chance, if the church is available, the door is open, I like to pop in and see what kind of church it is and see what's inside. I, when I was in Amsterdam, I went into the Roman Catholic Church and I go around looking at all the idols and all the paintings. And, 
they come out and I have an idea as to what it is inside. I want to learn, I want to see, I want to see what is happening. And so, when you go to a Reformed church, if you realize that if it is really a Reformed church, the preaching is always central. All the false churches, the preaching is no longer focused, the focal point. It's very interesting. And when you, the Roman Catholic Church do not have the pulpit in the center. If you go to Geneva, I visited some years ago, you go to the church that used to have John Calvin as the pastor. It's still there. It's called St. Peter's Cathedral. Because John Calvin died so many years ago, it is still known as a Reformed Church, yes. But when you go into the hall, you realize the pulpit is no longer in the center. It's very interesting. You go to St. Andrew Cathedral or St. Paul's Cathedral in London, you realize one thing, the pulpit is not in the center. It's symbolic. It's symbolic. The first mark of a true church is that of preaching the true gospel. Okay? The second mark is found, if you go back there, in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verses 41 to 42, you read there, brothers and sisters, you find the word baptized. They were baptized. The keeping of the two sacraments of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were baptized. Okay? In verse 41. Look, 42 says, breaking of bread. That's another way of describing the Lord's Supper, which we'll be partaking later on. Alright? So that's what it is. As frequently as possible, Christians are meant to keep the sacraments of the Lord. That is why it is a false church for para churches to call themselves para churches. It is a false organization to take the role of a Christian organization or a church. A para church and yet they cannot perform the Lord's Supper and Christian baptism because they are not a true church and yet they continue and they ask people to give them their tithes and give them monthly donation to support their missionary and their effort brothers and sisters we cannot do that we cannot do that not because we are jealous or we don't want to be threatened by them no it is because they are not doing things properly if you want to be a church be a church preach the true gospel and secondly administer the sacraments of Jesus Christ they don't do that and yet how dare they call for the God's people to give them donation to give them their tithes instead of giving to just give to them to support them and this and that no no we cannot do it not because we we, we need the money for our church no 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 that's not true it's because they are not the true church of Jesus Christ for example birth Merv is a true church. You know why? Because Merv sent out missionaries and Merv will make the missionary baptize and administer the Lord's Supper. They send out pastors and teachers, you see? And that's why we support, even though Merv is a kind of para church. But it's a different kind of para church from the para churches we are so used to in Singapore. The third point of a true church is here provided in the Word of God is that of the practice of church discipline. The old church that we are part of, brothers and sisters, would allow people, all sorts of people, in sin. And they don't discipline them. In fact, I know of a church where the, the pastor's daughter married a non-Christian and uh, the church said, how come you do not uh, discipline the, the, the pastor's daughter and the pastor get angry? And say no. And then start to quote the authority of a uh, higher ranking pastor son of another church. No, brothers and sisters, it's wrong. Whether it's the pastor's son, the pastor's daughter, no, no. The practice of churches. When one of our reformed church, churches in Singapore, when the pastor's son married a non-Christian, the pastor himself requested the church session to discipline the son and excommunicate the son. Was the pastor happy? not the pastor was in tears and in pain and in agony but the pastor being a reformed man said you must do it not because of me you must do it because of the Lord's glory we must uphold Christian discipline even if it means my own son can you please my beloved brothers and sisters turn to the passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 1 Corinthians chapter 5, I would like to read this rather long passage. 
for the sake of our education and for the sake of our benefit. 1 Corinthians 5, I'm going to read for you the first 13 verses. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. And a kind of sexual immorality that is not even tolerated among the Gentiles. A man is sleeping with his father's wife. And you are arrogant. Shouldn't you be filled with grief and remove from your congregation the one who did this? Even though I am absent in the body, I am present in spirit. As one who is present with you in this way, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who has been doing such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus, and I am with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus, hand that one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little leaven, leaven leavens the old bunch of dough? Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new unleavened bunch as indeed you are. For Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us observe the feast not with old leaven or with the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I write to you in a letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. I did not mean the immoral people of this world or the greedy and the swindlers or the idolaters. Otherwise, you would have to leave the world. But actually, I write to you not to associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister and is sexually immoral or greedy and idolater or verbally abusive, a drunkard or a swindler, do not even eat with such a person. But what business is it of mine to judge outsiders? Don't you judge those who are inside? God judges outsiders. Remove the evil person from among you. Now it's a long passage to read. But my beloved brothers and sisters, it is necessary to read it, to realize the practice of church discipline is demanded by the word of God. But it's quite clear, clear here that we're not talking about outside people. The people will say, hey, you say cannot eat with people who commit adultery, then why are you eating with so and so, Mr. So and so, and I saw you eating with so and so that he's not even a Christian. Exactly. Exactly. The Bible is clear, isn't it? Church discipline is only for people inside the church. It says here clearly, as for people who are outside, it's not considered because why? They are not Christian. You must win them, and minister to them, and reach out to them. Of course, if ever possible, if they become a bad influence to you morally, you shouldn't keep company with them too frequently. The only people who should remain in the church are those who show genuine faith and obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ as the head of the church. And that is very important. Now the church in history is given different kinds of names. Do you know that? For a time, for example in Acts chapter 9 and verse 2, the Acts of the Apostle tells us that the church is known as the way. This is also repeated in Acts 24 and verse 14. I worship the God of my ancestors according to the way which they call a sect. So it's called a sect, it's called a way, it's called by so many different names. But here, brothers and sisters, the church is called an assembly in the body of Christ. So let us keep these two pictures in mind and remember the three marks of the true church in mind as we think about what we are doing here. The place has been renovated, the toilet has been upgraded, we are grateful for this improvement to our use, for our use. But brothers and sisters, let us join forces now, unite together and serve the Lord. Why are we here? We are here because Jesus said, come, 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 come here. That's why we come here. And come here to do what, Lord? To worship God and to do the work, to fulfill the work of the gospel mission. And so let us never forget to support one another, to be one so that 
the head of the church will not be disgraced by us. And that is all this morning that I'm calling your attention to consider. Father.